Praise the Lord, saints, and happy 50th Father's Day. It's the 50th one, as I will share. And our text scripture for today, even though we're still in our impactful ambassadors of Christ series, which is based upon 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, um, just as we did for Mother's Day, and I talked about how uh, women can use their mothering skills um, in conjunction with being ambassadors for Christ. Now I'm going to talk about how fatherhood can also be used as part of our ambassadorship for Christ. So the text scripture overall for the series is 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. But today our main scripture will be Psalms 127 verses 3 through 5. Praise the Lord. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for giving us the opportunity to celebrate Father's Day today. And we do praise you, Lord, as I shared, that is the 50th um, occurrence of Father's Day. It's also Juneteenth this year. So we praise you, Father, for um, just blessing us with having this now a national uh, holiday that uh, the, the emancipation, um, the, the, the true freedom of slaves is being Celebrate it on today as well. So we just give you the praise, honor, and glory for both celebrations. There's no need to separate them. There's no need to say that one is more important than the other. Especially if we are black fathers, we can definitely um, celebrate uh, the two simultaneously. So we just thank and praise your Father for these things. We praise your Father for once again showing us in your word how we can see how to be impactful ambassadors for Christ as we focus on fatherhood today, how that could be an aspect of being an ambassador of Christ, that we could bring more children into your kingdom. And we just thank you, Father, for this and give you the praise, honor, and glory for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So as I said, we're talking about Father's Day today, and we are still staying under the theme of being impactful ambassadors for Christ. And as I researched this, um, I, I noted that the first recorded observance of a Father's Day was on June 5th, 1908. And it was done at a Methodist Episcopal Church in Fairmount, West Virginia, during a special uh, commemoration service to honor 360 men, most of them fathers, who had died in a coal mine explosion seven months earlier. So unfortunately, this the first celebration came as a result of a tragedy. Um, but uh, once again, we see the people of God noted that and they decided to honor these men. Um, now, one of the things that I did also learn is that even though that was the first um, recorded observance, uh, the origin is, is usually attributed to Sonora Louise Smart Dodd, who petitioned for her church in 1909 in Spokane, Washington, to similarly honor fathers as she listened to a Mother's Day sermon. Now in her situation, of course, she was not opposed to a Mother's Day sermon, but she felt that if we're gonna honor mothers, you know, we should also honor fathers. And she especially wanted to do that because her father William Jackson, Jackson Smart had continued raising her and her five siblings after her mother died in childbirth at, when she was at the age of 16. So, you know, she knew firsthand how important the significance of a father was, and she wanted to have a similar way of honoring fathers as they had honored mothers. Now, as we go on, this was in 1909, um, President Woodrow Wilson verbally approved of it being a holiday in 1916, but I guess it wasn't ratified. Uh, Calvin Coolidge made it a national event 
1924. Um, but once again, it was an event, not an official holiday. Um, Lyndon Johnson declared it to be the third Sunday of June in 1966, which is why we do it on the third Sunday of June every year. And then Richard Nixon finally signed a proclamation making it a nationally recognized holiday in 1972. So we do the math, 2022 minus 1972, it turns out that today is the 50th anniversary of Father's Day as a national holiday. And as I said, just as we addressed how women can be impactful ambassadors of Christ using their mothering skills, their ability to nurture, to reach out, to have compassion, um, fathers can do the same thing um, as they seek to be ambassadors for Christ. So one of the first things I'm going to look at today is we see it says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And it says, happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. Now, as we talk about um, quivers, we're referring to somebody who has a bow and arrows. And if you've ever seen, you know, superheroes like Green Arrow or people in the Olympics or, you know, people that are archers, whether it's in warfare or in sport, you know, they don't want to go down and say, okay, every time I need an arrow, oh, let me go look for one. No, they have this thing called a quiver on their back. So if they fire one arrow, then they can reach back, knowing that the quiver has arrows in it, they can reach back, grab another one, and just keep firing. Amen? But notice the key thing. They have the quiver on their back. Amen? And when you have an arrow, you're not just in most case of cases, randomly firing it somewhere. No, you have a target. You know, so you take the arrow out of your quiver, you aim, you, know, you may take into consideration how far away the object is that is your target, whether there's wind that might blow the arrow off course. You may even change the, the tip of the arrow. You know, if I'm shooting for a target um, and there's a paper target mounted, I can use one tip. If I have to hit wood, I need another tip that is sharper that can penetrate the wood. Unfortunately, if I'm doing it for sport, you know, for the people that are against that, but if you're hunting deer or something like that, you need something that can penetrate the body of your target. And of course, in warfare, you want something that is sharp that can penetrate the body of an opponent. And if he has some type of armor, it needs to go through that as well. Um, it's known also that not only do they change the tips of arrow arrows but you have some cultures um in in africa and other nations that would dip their arrow tips into poison so that if you got shot and hit by an arrow even if it didn't penetrate you let's say it just glanced your body but it cut you the poison in the tip of the arrow would basically do the work so you might be like oh i got glanced thank god they didn't kill me but later on I'm getting sick and the poison on the tip takes you out because they would get the venom from some of the most poisonous snakes to put on the tip of those arrows. They had to be literally really careful when they dipped them down because I could kill myself preparing this tip for my enemy. And matter of fact, pulling it out. Well, I better be a little careful. I don't want to scrape myself as I'm bringing it out. So having that queer quiver, once again, this is something that you have on your back. You have the arrows at the ready, and you have the mindset that I have a target where I want those arrows to go, and me as the archer, I'll help guide them to the target, taking into consideration, once again, how I need to penetrate, the amount of height as I shoot the arrow, whether wind can impact it. I take those things into consideration as I launch them, and as fathers, amen, we are to do the same thing. We don't take our children and just, oh, just throw them out in the world. No. You need to help guide them to where they're going and account for various conditions that could get them off course. But you still try to the best of your ability to launch them so that they not only hit the target, but they penetrate it. Amen. They have an impact. The same manner in which you have an impact upon them, 
You want the arrows, the children that you launch to have an impact as well. Amen. Not to just glance or bounce off the target. Now, one thing you'll see also is that it says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of arrows. Well, what if you only have one kid? In my case, I have two biological children. But it says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Two is not exactly filling a quiver. <laughs> the quiver is, you know, round. It's, it's got room. You can stick a bunch of arrows in there. So it kind of gives you the mindset, if you're um, attentive, the fact that your, your quiver could be full of your biological children, but there could also be people that you father. Amen. You know, they might not be necessarily in your home, but they serve, you could serve as a role model, a mentor, somebody that gives them somebody to aspire to. I've shared a number of times that I had a natural father that was with me to, I was, I think, 19 years old, Ralph Fox. But then I also had a man that was very notable in my life, Pam and Pat had the pleasure of meeting him because uh, later on he became our accountant. His name was um, Rudolph Bell. And he wasn't my biological father, but because I was best friends with his son, I spent a lot of time over at the house over the years, and I saw him and his demeanor and how he conducted himself. And he was a Golden Gloves boxer, and he was an ex-Army um, military man. And the thing that really s stuck out to me is that he spoke with a, you know, not only a booming voice, but there was authority behind it. And he was a businessman, an accountant, and he had clients, and he served on board. So he was not my biological father, and I had a biological father, but he was a father to me because I was like, wow, this giant of a man, amen, not necessarily in stature, but in all the things that he stood for and how he conducted himself. He wasn't out running the streets, and he wasn't out brawling and getting drunk and doing all this nonsense. He was a man of of power and authority in my life. That's how I saw him, and it gave me something that I want to be like that, amen? I saw the attributes in him. So in a certain sense, you could say that, you know, he had three sons, um, Rudy Jr., um, and then Charles, and then Creighton. He had three natural sons, and he had a daughter, Sandra. But you could say that he had four children in his quiver, but... I was in, I was I made sure I jumped in the, the backpack as well, amen, and went along for the ride and learned various things as I observed his life. And I was blessed um, before he passed to sit down with him one day, and I just told him, I said, you, you know, you really in inspired me. You showed me, you know, not necessarily in words, but you showed me that, hey, I could be a success, and I could be educated, and I could have you know, a career, and I can have a good family. You showed me these things, and I want to thank you for, you know, the inspiration that you gave me as a father figure in my life. And as us being uh, men of God, especially, we should be in the same manner. Yes, I, I have two wonderful sons. I love them. And if somebody comes against them, um, you could curse at me. You could, you could bruise or injure my body. You could say all sorts of things about me, but... You mess with Colin Trey Fox, you will find the finger of God, a tornado with wind velocity over 200 miles an hour coming your way. You can mess with me. Don't mess with them. Amen? And I'm not saying that, oh, I'm going to jump in every time somebody opposes them. But I'm saying if you put them at risk of danger, you know, that's extreme, know that war is coming your way. Because as a loving father, as long as I breathe, I'm going to have their back. And that's the way that we as fathers need to be. Not that we want to be in violent situations, that sort of thing. Just the mindset that I'm protective. You know, we know that we serve a jealous God that is protective over his children. We've seen cover to cover in the Bible how, you know, people did extreme things to try to exterminate the, the Jews. And God would step in and just, bam, decimate an entire nation. You know, so God has that mindset. And that's one thing that I have as well. So we should have the mindset that, yes, we have biological children, but there are people, amen, who may not, not have had that blessing of a father figure in their life. There's absolutely nothing wrong with adding some additional arrows to your quiver that may not uh, necessarily be born of you. The same way, some of us were not born of the nation of Israel, amen, but yet God 
brought us into his family through our forefather Abraham. He grafted us into the branch. He brought us into the family even though he didn't have to. So praise the Lord. Now, um, oh, and one thing I, I forgot to mention, amen, the word quiver. In the underlying Hebrew, it means covering, amen, covering. That's one of the translations. Serving as a father, amen, you cover and protect your children. You're not sitting back watching them being harmed or going astray. You step in as necessary to ensure that they're going to have a, a stable and, and safe life and one in which they can fulfill the promises of God that are in their life. All right, next let's go to Psalm chapter 68, verses 4 through 6. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Notice that it talks about the description of God and it says that, you know, we extol him that rideth upon the heavens. So looking at that image, he rides upon the, the heavens itself, amen? And we bow down and we sing unto God and we sing praises to his name and we rejoice before him, but yet in all his glory and his grandeur, it still says that God does not deem it too low to be a father to the fatherless. You know, in all things, you know, he's a, a wonderful and splendid God despite, I mean, beyond any type of description that we have. But yet, he's still a father that reaches out. And as we see here, he is a father to the fatherless. That word fatherless means to be lonely, a bereaved person, or an orphan. Once again, it means to be lonely, a bereaved person, or an orphan. God is a father to those who are lonely, to those who are bereaved or grieving, and to those who are orphans, those who literally have no parents. That's such an incredible statement that, praise the Lord, the creator of the universe itself, with all the galaxies and the planets and the stars and all the things that are out there in creation, still does not think it's too low to say when I see somebody that is full of loneliness and grief and despair, somebody that says, I have no person who cares about me or to parent me. God says, I will be your parent. Amen. And we see here that if his children, those or those he brings in as his children are in bondage, you know, bound in chains, that he brings them out of that. And it says he sets the solitary or those who are alone, he puts them in families. And you may not be in a natural family, but God will put you into a spiritual family. Or at the very least, you are brought into the family and the kingdom of God. So God lets you sit back there in that place of loneliness and despair. He reaches out to you and becomes your father. Now, as we're looking at fatherhood and being ambassadors of Christ, in a similar manner that we may see people who are not necessarily grieving because of a death in their family, but they're living a life where they're full of grief because they feel alone, you know, despondent. They feel like they're orphans. Nobody cares about me. And if we are in the likeness of God, the same way he sees the fatherless and says, I'll be a father to you. If we're walking in his shoes and following after the same pattern, how do we look back at, at somebody who is in that state? They feel like they're an orphan and unloved and say that I'm not going to be somebody that may not be their biological father, but I'll be a father to you anyway. We need to reach out the same way God extended himself. Amen. And sacrificed his only son to reach out to those who are fatherless and to bring them in. 
God wants us to extend that fatherhood as well to some who may not necessarily be our natural children. But it's a mindset. It's an attitude of love. And I caught something in, uh, let's look at this, John chapter 14, 15 to 23. And it's something we miss if we just read it in English, but it's in there. Um, uh, John 14, 15 through 23. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. <coughs> he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, not that bad one, <laughs> Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. So, as I said, um, we're, we're first seeing in the words of Jesus himself, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And this is something that he says a couple of times in this passage of scripture. So he's emphasizing the point. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, which is loving God the Father, loving me, um, doing the things that we command of you, which includes you know, going out into all the world and preaching the gospel and doing it unto the uttermost parts of the earth, reaching everybody that's possible with the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that he says here uh, in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. That word comfortless is bereaved, parentless or orphans so the same way that we saw previously that god is a father to the fatherless which would be the bereaved or the orphan we're seeing here that jesus christ is specifically stating i will not leave you bereaved in a state where i'm unloved nobody cares about me i will not leave you parentless and i will not leave you as an orphan. And if Jesus is making that promise, the same way I said that we're made in likeness of God and we should be doing things like that and being a father to the fatherless, if Jesus is telling us that he will not leave people bereaved, parentless, or orphans, and we're falling in the likeness of Christ, in the same manner, we should similarly have compassion for those who are full of grief and who feel parentless and as if they're orphans, amen? So we need to be willing to reach out to those, amen, who are going through that condition in life or that state of mind that nobody cares about me. And one of the things that we see, you know, we see certain situ situations on the news. Um, I'm sure we've sometimes come across situations where um, unfortunately a lot of, we see a lot of anger and hopelessness, destruction uh, in young people today. And you probably could trace a lot of that back to the fact that even though it seems that they're only operating in rebellion, the reality is a lot of them are lashing out because they feel unloved. Amen. Um, and the question is, you know, who is a better source of imparting the love that they need to turn around their destiny and to heal their broken hearts and that sense of nobody cares about me than those of us who know Christ, amen? We are the ones that can impart the love that they need 
amen, to, to soften their hearts. And quite frankly, it's more than just softening the hearts. It's healing the wounds that they have. You know, a lot of them have a hole in their heart. And sometimes they might even be in a home with natural parents, but because, you know, these things have not been instilled in them, they have that sense of hopelessness and being unloved, which once again manifests itself in anger and dysfunctional or destructive behavior. So as Jesus is saying that he will not leave anybody comfortless. Amen. In the same manner, we should have the same attitude itself when it presents itself. You know, somebody that's going through that hardship. And I you know, spoke to somebody uh, just yesterday that dealt with the situation where they brought somebody into their life and it was not easy. <laughs> There's a lot of rebelliousness. There was a, you know, attitude that was pushing it back against the rules and the regulations and how you conduct yourself and interact with somebody. But yet, you know, this person continued to instill love in the person also said that we're only going to allow a certain type of behavior, but they did not leave that person in the place of anger and feeling bereaved. They continued to parent them and help turn the situation around in that individual's life. So in the same manner, amen, as we're talking about Father's Day and being impactful ambassadors of Christ, using, you know, those things that are instilled in us innately in the same manner, we can look for opportunities where people need, you know, a father figure, a role model, somebody who can inspire them, and especially somebody who will take the time and, you know, impart things in them, or at the very least show that they care about them to help turn around that sense of being parentless. Now, um, as we are faced with situations like that, one of the things that we need to especially do is to avoid being aristocratic. You know, a lot of times we think about ambassadors and diplomats. We think about people that are going to, you know, other countries and, you know, they're, they have, you know, uh, a group of, of security persons around them. A lot of times they're driven around in, you know, protected cars. They, they live in embassies and they're, they're going into other um, governments, buildings, you know, palaces or different places to negotiate treaties or to just um, uh, just be in a place where the position to interact with, to speak with, to negotiate in some cases to improve the conditions of that country. And a lot of times when you see them and you think about them, you think about various aristocrats. But as we are, are looking at being fathers to the fatherless, um, as ambassadors of Christ, we got to be sure that even though we have a certain demeanor about us and a certain authority that we're not aristocratic or, you know, we're at a place where we're so high minded that we cannot reach those who are in um, different circumstances than we live in on a daily basis. You know, sometimes they might be in um, rough neighborhoods, in other words, you know, so the foreign land that God will send us in as diplomats might be a rough neighborhood or maybe they come from a different social economic background. And you may not necessarily be able to relate to it, but you still have to position yourself so that you can minister to them and once again, serve as a role model and mentor as God leads you to be able to impart wisdom into their life. And once again, bring about healing in their heart that there's any areas where they're broken. So ambassadors may go into foreign lands that are war-torn, impoverished, devoid of some of the advantages of their home countries. But, and despite this, they must continue to be approachable and not have airs of superiority when interacting with those who they are called to minister to or to help negotiate various things. Amen? So we can't be walking around with our airs. <laughs> we can't have this demeanor of superiority, like, like we're doing them a favor because we've taken the time to interact with them. No, amen, we need to humble ourselves and, you know, make ourselves approachable and somebody that can step in to serve, once again, as a loving guide, 
a role model or a father figure in their lives. Amen. The same way God extended himself and reached out to us when we were flailing around in our mess. And I don't know about you, but the God I met when I got converted to Christ was not this haughty God that was unapproachable and so beyond me. And I was so low, even though reality is that we are so low in comparison to God. But God did not introduce himself to, our, to us that way. The Holy Spirit was gentle and meek. And the Jesus that we met, you know, even though he's high and lifted up, his train fills the temple and he sits at the right hand of God. The Jesus that we met and we still interact with on a daily basis is still approachable. Even though he doesn't have to be, he is still approachable. Have you ever felt that the Jesus you interact with, like, oh, I got to lower myself to allow you to pray and interact with me? No, we have a, a personal Jesus that we interact with. Amen. And that's why he tells us to boldly come to his throne of grace. Amen. In times of trouble. If, if he was too high minded for us or too aristocratic, would you want to boldly rush in? No, you'd be like, I'm already down in the dumps regarding my situation. Now I got to go grovel before you too? No. He allows us to come in and say, hey, Father God, hey, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I'm messed up right now. I need some help. They're very approachable to us. So we're operating in the likeness of God, even though, you know, we might be living in a middle class, upper middle class or, you know, great neighborhood. And we go to the roughest of neighborhoods or they come to us. We still have to be somebody that is approachable to them. You can't reach those um, who cannot approach you. They're going to put their a wall up or they're going to they're going to sense you know, a level, level of pomposity or arrogance in you. you know, amen? So we have to meet them where they live, and we have to ensure that we're approachable. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. So look at that. No errors about it. This is the testimony of our con conscience that in simplicity and sincerity. Amen. And by the by, by, and by the grace of God. We had our conversation with people in the world. So we met them where they lived. You know, we're not sitting here talking like we're a member of academia when you're talking to somebody who has a fifth grade reading level. Amen. They, ain't gonna they can't relate to you. You got to be packaged. Amen. And not a phony way, but to package yourself in a manner that you can interact with and reach them. You got to meet them where they live. And once again, not only go to meet them. But in the situations where they need to come to somebody, we need to ensure that we are approachable. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And like I said, it's done not with fleshly wisdom. You know, not don't impress them with your degrees and your certifications and your career and how big your vocabulary is. No, that's not going to be approachable. You got to be able to speak their lingo. You need to be approachable. They need to see you that as, you know, your, your achievements and the accolades and all the material wealth we have, that can serve the, the purpose of giving them something to aspire to. But it shouldn't be something that makes them say, oh, I can't go to them. They're too wonderful for me. Amen. See, see, so there's a difference. You don't have to hide the things you have. But the stuff should serve as, hey, this is something to inspire you that you could do this too not something that makes them feel so low that they can't approach you. And there's a huge difference. And that's the material side. On the demeanor side, it's the same thing. You know, they shouldn't have to feel like, oh, me approaching them, they're going to have to lower themselves so much to interact with me. I, I saw it. 
No, they should just be able to come up and say, hey, Mr. Hey, Ms. Can I talk to you about something? You should be that approachable in all situations. Praise the Lord. And as, you're, as you interact with them, the same thing. Um, let's go to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans 12, 9 through 17. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly, brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. <laughs> Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, continuing con instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So notice that. Um, it says, let love be without dissimulation. Um, in other words, don't have any type of favoritism or... You know, like, I love this person a little more because uh, they're like me, you know, whatever the categories are, race, interests, you know, that person Christian, that person is. No, let your love be without any criteria or restrictions or um, fleshly um, means of giving one person more than the other. Amen. And that doesn't mean that, okay, if somebody... As a Christian, you have certain interests that are mutual, um, that you won't have certain things that the two of you share. Um, you know, one person said, uh, I love football more. The other person, I like hockey. And another person is, is basketball. Well, me, I'm going to talk. If it's a conversation, I'm going to hold a, maybe a longer conversation with the person that loves basketball the most. And then football and then the NBA. I mean, and then hockey would be last. I really don't know hockey. But I should have the same love for all three persons. Amen. And, you know, I'll try to have a conversation. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the players, but hey, I'll engage you. <laughs> I can't really talk. To... <laughs> I can tell you what a hat trick is. <laughs> the penalty box, but outside of that, uh, I even may even rattle off a few teams here and there. But you start talking about the players and he's a forward for this or a goalie. I'm like, sorry, dude. <laughs> I'm trying here. But the person should still be able to feel like I want to engage them in conversation. And even then, I could just literally say, like, look, if you want to share a few things, that's fine. I don't really understand it. But, hey, you know, you talk about, a, you know, this this rule or whatever, like, you have to share with me what that means because I'm lost. So you don't have to totally repel the person. You can still be approachable. But once again, just love them all the same, even though your interests might vary. Um, then we see here to, or I'll go further down, that word mind um, says mind not high things. Now, the word mind means to exercise the mind, to be disposed to, to set the affection on. It tells us not to mind high things. So when we're interacting with people, even though they may be di from different backgrounds, maybe you had a much easier life or you came from a, a, a better um childhood or social economic status um it, it, even though you, those things may vary and in some cases you know the world might say you had a better life or you're more important or significant type of person um, it tells us here that we don't mind high things we don't think we're better than or um we don't set our our affection to certain things that would put them in a place where they feel isolated or less than nor do we set our affection on things that, uh, well, um, well, I'm, a, I'm mindful of this, about this type of person. So when you, auto, when you go to meet somebody that's not of your type of upbringing or lifestyle, you automatically come in with a, oh, well, they must be like this, so uh, 
uh, I don't really want to hug those people because you know that you, you see what I'm saying? Like you don't put these errors and these criteria and make somebody feel lesser than because something about them and their background or lifestyle or whether whatever is different than yours. Amen. Don't put on ungodly fleshly heirs that you're better than or you're more important than. No, treat everybody the same. And that word condescend is actually saying, you know, to condescend, it doesn't mean to be condescending. It means humble yourself, you know, um, empty yourself of your self-importance and your greatness to be able to minister and interact with people of a lower state. That's what it's basically saying. Um, and then one of the things about the word dissimulation that we saw earlier, too, it talked about uh, let love be without subterfuge. Amen. <laughs> a lot of times you think about subterfuge, you think about like spy movies and stuff like that. Like something's going on secret behind the scenes. Like don't have nothing secret about you hidden. When you're interacting with people, be open, be approachable, be loving. Don't have any motives that are hidden, in other words. But just let your love flow and be genuine, in other words, without hypocrisy. Um, so we talked about your quiver can <coughs> contain arrows that maybe you didn't necessarily build or give birth to. Um... Then we talked about we should avoid being high-minded, aristocratic, better than other people. You know, walk in humility and don't have airs about ourselves. You know, if you had a better background, if you have more education, if you have a better career, that's the blessings of God. Amen. Gave you maybe better, allowed you to have better circumstances than that person had. It doesn't make you better than them. It's by the grace of God you are at that place. But don't use that to make other people feel lower. Use that to say, hey, maybe I can impart something that will help heal and elevate somebody else to not to being like me, but to being what where God has called them to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. So then um, we'll also look at the fact that we need to interact with other cultures effectively. We need to interact with other cultures effectively. As I said earlier, regardless of our social economic status, academic, or professional credentials, we should be able to communicate with other cultures effectively to reach them for Christ, just as, you know, earthly ambassadors do. You know, you might be somebody from the United States, you could go to some war-torn, impoverished third world country. And when those ambassadors go to those countries, they know the culture, they know the lingo, they know some of the guidelines here. I remember I did a case study um, um, of various people groups um, over in, in Pakistan and um, they had guidelines like you know the rights of women and as it relates to witnesses in the court of law like certain things you need to know about the culture before you go because you could cause an incident as I shared last week so you know as we're going to minister to people that might be fatherless and maybe you know deal with circumstances or in situations that we may not necessarily be able to relate to, let's take the time to, you know, don't go in on our agenda saying, well, I'm going to teach them this and I'm going to teach them that and I'm going to tell them this, this, and that. Straighten their lives out. No. Try to get to relate to where they live and the culture that they have uh, and the things that they may be going through. That's the best way to reach them. Reach them where they live. Amen. That doesn't mean that you have to sit back and just allow any kind of chaos or, or things that go on, but at least know the audience that you're speaking to. I mean, if we go to speak at a TED Talk, you're going to say, hey, here's my subject, here's probably the likely audience, and let me present things in a manner that they'll receive it and take the knowledge that I've imparted and run with it. So we go to minister to somebody that feels fatherless, they're angry, they're dysfunctional, they're rebellious. They don't see a bright future ahead. Amen? Take the time to pray and say, God, show me how to reach that audience. You know, show me how to minister to that person. I can't expect to help turn their life around when I can't even reach their heart and open up their mind to the fact that 
this person really does care for me. They're not in it for like a five minute conversation and they're gone, but this person will really stick in there and will hear me out. It might hear some things that aren't, aren't normal or things they even want to hear, but that person is going to be here for me. If you're going to be a parent to somebody, you got to be able to stay in the long game, not say I'm just going to do a quick hit. They'll get saved and then, okay, I move on. No, a father doesn't move on. Amen. A true father is going to be a father for life. I'm going to be, to, to, to the day I take my life, last breath, I'm going to be an engaged father with my sons. And, you know, to those who are spiritual children, I'm going to be engaged and active. You know, now if they say, I don't want to hear you, Brian, or, you know, or Papa B, whatever they call me, that's their choice. My perspective, I'm in it. I'm in it for the long haul. I'm in it for life. Fatherhood does not end. And they can go have their own children. They can be to a place where they have, you know, biological and spiritual children. Well, I'll take them on as my spiritual great-grandchildren. I'm in fatherhood for life until this body stops functioning. I'm in it. And I'm sure, like, you know, Kelly, you're the other father here today. I'm sure you feel the same way. With, with your daughter, you know, we're in this for the long haul. And just because the child does something you don't like, says something the wrong way, you might have some discipline or something they don't want to hear. You may have to give some tough love at times, but the fatherhood never ends. I'm going to knock you upside your head. I'm still your father. <laughs> Go right now. <laughs> but you're still a father. Amen. And that's what people need to see sometimes the fact that you're in it for the long haul you know you're not they the world's already taught them that i'm unloved and rejected they don't need somebody that they can perceive you're going to come in and the first time they say something the wrong way oh, i ain't got to deal with this this is just too much for me no they want somebody that you know you're going to be maybe lashing out at screaming at you tell them something for their own good you don't know what the blank you're talking about. You're going to leave or you're going to stay in for the long game. That's the thing that will penetrate their heart as impactful ambassadors of Christ to turn things around. They need to perceive that the same way our loving God never walks away from us. They need to see in us serving in the likeness and the pattern of God and Jesus that we're going to be in there for the long haul as well. You might be acting unlovable right now, but I still love you. <laughs> That's what they need to say. Amen. So let's look at um, Philippians chapter 2. Oops. Ah, 12 through 15. And one thing I, I had noted, like we have all these uh, credentials and careers and things like that. You had enough, you had the capacity to learn what you needed to do to get that degree. But you don't have the capacity to learn what it takes to meet that person where they live. So is it a case that you can't learn it or you don't want to learn it? It's a big difference. I think most cases you don't want to learn it. So we have to say, hey, I'm going to be willing once again to do what it takes as God is leading me. If he has placed me in that role to be a father figure. Um, Philippians 2, 12 to 15. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. <laughs> Guess what? Sometimes you're going to feel like murmuring <laughs> and complaining, dealing with people that God has placed in your life to be a father figure to, uh, whether it's biological or spiritual. There's gonna be times you be like, they get on my last, I am so tired. Why well, I gotta repeat myself 2,000 times to the nth power of, <laughs> that's the, and God's sitting there, <laughs> you're complaining about one child 
I gave you, biological or otherwise, you're murmuring and complaining about one child I gave you and disputing. Why do I have to do it? I got you, <laughs> knucklehead, and that child, and the billions and billions of other people. <laughs> Who you think got <laughs> a right to murmur and complain, and yet I don't. Get over yourself. <laughs> Stay in the trenches. And yes, we're going to have our moments, but it shouldn't be a situation where like, you get to a place where I just, I just hate the fact that I have this responsibility or I resent the fact that I have to be this person in that individual's lives. If God has, and you got to think if God has entrusted you to have that role in that person's life, it's a blessing. You know, all blessings aren't necessarily an easy road with no, you know, bumps in the road. But it can still be a tremendous blessing. And here's the thing. You know, if you can see beyond the rawness of that person that is broken and hurt. And once again, they felt fatherless. And God has saw, saw fit that I believe you're mature enough to be the person that's going to be the father figure in their life. And take that raw, lashing out person and convert them into somebody whose heart softens, that comes to know him. And then I can propel them to their destiny. And I entrusted you to be a part of that process. Amen. If we saw it that way, we probably wouldn't be murmuring and disputing. And we see here, you know, we should be trying to be blameless in heart and harmless. You know, it says here, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. We're in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. You know, but God has put you in a position where you've come to know him. You've come to know his principles. He's made you one of the lights in the world. If he's made you one of the lights in the world, don't be surprised when somebody out there that's fatherless sees that light shining and they're trying to get out of the darkness you know, and they don't even know why. They say, I just see a light. I'm in darkness. I feel parentless. I feel depressed, bereaved. Life is just kicking me in the rear end every day, and I have no hope. Wait a minute. So what's that light? And they follow that light, and that light is you. Amen. You might be the only light they see in all that darkness. So it's an honor that God enabled us to shine brightly enough that it pierced through the darkness in their life. And that person who was parentless and hopeless now sees a light that is showing them the path out of that darkness. That's a blessing to us. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we should do it without murmuring and complaining. Let's see what my time is like. Okay. Um, you can write this down for later. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. It just talks about, you know, to the weak I became as the weak. Um, to them that are lawless, you know, I approach them as, you know, not being lawless as well, but pretty much understanding that they're lawless and trying to impart in them <laughs> the principles to get them to abide by the principles of society to turn their life around. I used to go to the um, meetings before the pandemic with the special prosecutor. Um, sometimes they would have they would have police at all levels, um, <coughs> local police, county police, um, um, state troopers. Sometimes we'd have F FBI and um, uh, DEA agents there, and we'd all be meeting. Um, um, it was once a quarter, and hoping that they started back up again. Um, and we would discuss various things. And one time there was this prosecutor um, that came in and he was just sharing a hybrid probation program where um, the, the child would still come before a judge with a case. There would still be a penalty um, levied for the offense, um, but there would be conditions. And that's why they call it a hybrid probation. You're on probation but it's a hybrid because instead of it being the, the normal type of probation where it just stays on your record, if you do certain things over a certain course of time, we'll waive it and it'll be totally stricken for your record. Like no background search will find it. Because there's cases to where you could have something on your record 
and years later, background search could still bring it up, even though it's supposed to be a sponge or whatever. But they said this case would be like it never, ever existed. And not only that, but they would give the person aid because they had one situation where a young man kept coming into the court. And after multiple appearances, the judge is like, young man, it's like, I'm doing everything in my power outside of breaking the law, trying not to send you to jail. Like, help me, young man. Like, I I'm trying to give you a break. Every time I turn around, you're here in my courtroom. So, 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 so talk to me. Hey, let's, let's just talk. Why do you keep ending up before my court? And this is with drug offenses. And he said, your honor, he said, you know, I'm one of several children. Father's not my life. My mother's working like a dog, but we don't have enough money to pay, you know, for the utilities, you know, to keep water and lights and heat. You know, it's hard for us to have enough money even to eat. So the only way I can get help my mom get food on the table is like, I got to go to the corner. He's like, I don't want to do it, but... You know, it's, it's, I'm not even worried about me, like, but I have younger siblings. They're not able to eat. So, hey, I go to, the, I go to the corner, make a few bucks, bam, we got food on the table. So they put him on a hybrid probation, and part of that probation included family assistance, counseling, um, job training, just different things, medical coverage, all these different things came with that. And they ended up getting a bunch of kids. They started them out, I think, at... 12 or 13, they follow them all the way to high school graduation, and in many cases, help get a lot of them into college. And the records are expunged. But the funny thing is, the guy who's talking about the program, he's like, you know, I'm this white dude. I go down in Camden. Hey, man, you don't know nothing about the streets. White kind of suit. You don't know nothing about the streets, man. This is out of the hood. We, you know, you know, Hispanic and black. What do you know about these streets? And he's like, I was a white boy that was on these streets <laughs> with the brothers and stuff. He said, I grew up on these streets. <laughs> I had all the mannerisms. I did all this stuff. He said, but one day a cop step, stepped in and told me, like, look, either you're going to turn things around or you're going to be behind bars or you're going to be dead, but I'm willing to help you. So he said a policeman helped steer his life around, helped father him. Then he's coming into the hood as a prosecutor. You know, he's helping other people. But this is a way in which you can change lives around and lives around. Amen. Being willing to go into the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or generation and being a shining light. Amen. To help turn things around. Praise the Lord. So I'm. Um, Last thing I want to share, I'm going to move on. Um, I'll share this verse with you, though. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. And one of the things it says in verse uh, 5 of 2 Timothy, let me go to that. Uh, it tells us to be, you know, uh, to, to endure affliction. Sometimes you got to endure some afflictions of that relate to you. Sometimes you got to deal with stuff that's related to your children when you decide to parent somebody spiritually. But it says to do the work of an evangelist. Don't sit there waiting back, waiting for somebody to come to you. Do the work of an evangelist. You go out and reach those who could take advantage of things. And then it says, make full proof of your ministry. It's easy to say like, oh, I'm a minister of the gospel. I'll preach the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere. But wait a minute, there's that young person that's hurting, that's struggling, that's unlovable, and you ain't got time for them. Make full proof of your ministry. One of the things we talk about in um, martial arts training sometimes is that, you know, you need to pressure test it. It's good to say, like, okay, if somebody's throwing a little block punch and you're blocking it, oh, yeah, I'm good. No, you need to pressure test it. Make full proof. Let somebody throw a... <laughs> hey, hey, make it a knock you across the room if you don't block it right. That'll pressure test that thing. You know, you want to pressure test your ministry? Deal with somebody who is undealable, <laughs> unlovable, <laughs> rebellious, disrespectful. That'll make full proof 
of your ministry. The, the phrase full proof means to carry out fully, to completely assure or convince, and to entirely accomplish. Your ministry is not foolproof when you only go to the easy people. It's foolproof when you deal with the most difficult and you still have an impact. As it relates to us being, you know, fathers and impactful ambassadors of Christ, amen? There should be some people that, you know, sometimes you're gonna to have to deal with a few rebellious children. Well, are you willing to make sure you're foolproof by, you know, doing everything possible, amen, to help turn things around in that person's life if God has called you to serve in that role? The final subject for today is that your sons, or your children rather, <clears throat> biological or otherwise, will carry on your legacy. Your children, biological or otherwise, will carry on your legacy. Um, as we looked at the text scripture for today, it says children are a heritage of, of the Lord. The word children in the underlying Hebrew you know, I thought it was going to be something like sons or daughters, but it actually says a builder of the family name. Lo, builders of the family name are a heritage of the Lord. When you parent somebody, they carry your family name and reputation. You know, my biological sons will carry on the fox name. Um, you know, somebody... Um, may parent somebody spiritually. They won't carry on the, the Fox family name, but they carry on the precepts I taught, the things that I stood for, the demeanor I had. You know, those are the things that carry on. You know, so, you know, if they see me, you know, show hospitality and compassion and go to the hospital and minister to people. And, and over the years, like pretty much everybody has um, been associated with, with Pam and I. And I'm not saying they've only done it because of Pam and I's instruction, because I believe a lot of it was wired in the people. But one of the things, we may not be perfect, but one of the things we'll be able to say, whether it's carrying the Fox name or carrying the le legacy of our ministry, is that people who are spiritual children, they have hospitality. They go into hospitals, you know, they minister to people that are going through trials and tribulations. They carry on the reputation or the, the standards and the demeanor that we have. Amen. So they carry on the, the family name without disparaging it. And we see here that um, builders of the family name or children, it says they are a heritage of the Lord. The word heritage means an inheritance or an heirloom. So builders of the family name are an inheritance or an heirloom of the Lord. That is what you're producing when you father people. Amen. So whether they carry on your, you know, family name, your legal name, or they carry on the reputation of being associated with you, they are carrying on the heritage of what or the legacy of what you imparted into them. And if you've taken the time to do it the right way, then the things that they carry on will be great. And then they can pass it on and then go on and on and on. And that's a blessed thing. Um, you know, I have no uh, fear whatsoever that, you know, Pam and I get getting saved, you know, uh, 80, 1987. Um, we got what we got instilled in us from our spiritual parents. And the same way he studied the word diligently, he broke it down to Hebrew Greek and he had a mindset to go help people that were impoverished and to pray for those who are sick, go into homes and minister to people. We carried on the legacy of our spiritual parents, you know, um, the Granites, John and Carol Granite. We've carried on the heritage of what they imparted into us in so many different ways, amen. And now we have been extending that into other people's lives and, you know, our biological children, Kyle Trey, and our spiritual children, they're carrying on a lot of the same things in terms of heritage. So we could do that, amen? Um, and we see that in uh, Psalm 47, 1 through 4. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. O clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. 
For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. And one of the things, one of the reasons why this caught my eye, um, it talks about God being a great king over all the earth. He is high and terrible. It says he shall subdue the people under his and the nations under his feet. Oh, wait, it's subdue the people under us and the nation under our feet. But one thing that really stuck out to me, verse 4, he shall choose our inheritance for us. That's not just a material thing. And we've already seen that children are a heritage or an inheritance of the Lord. In other words, God could choose some of the children that are going to be part of your inheritance. But notice that it says, he shall choose our inheritance. You might have spiritual children that <laughs> you might be like, I don't want to deal with them. And God's like, I'm the one who chooses the inheritance. Go parent them. Go be a father to that child. Amen. He shall choose our inheritance. Do you think that Abraham knew all of us would be part of his family? But guess what? We are part of the heritage of Abraham's seed. We are Abraham's children spiritually. That goes back again. We are not the biological. Nobody in this room is the biological children of Abraham. But we are the spiritual children that got engrafted in to the blessings of our forefather, Abraham. Amen. So we were chosen as part of the inheritance for Abraham. In the same manner, there are going to be children that God has chosen for us that we need to parent. And, you know, we do it the right way. It's going to turn that around to bring more inheritance, more legacy, more children in the future generations. And I'm going to close with one last passage today. Praise the Lord. Um, Psalms 2, 1 through 8. Why do the heathen rage? <clears throat> Excuse me. And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the othermost parts of the earth for thy possession. <coughs> Praise the Lord. All right, so um, we see here God promised his anointing. Amen. You know, specifically, it starts out with capital S, the son, Jesus. You know, um, you are my son. It says, ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for my inheritance. Um, well, Jesus is asking, amen, for his inheritance. All those who will come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, that is part of his inheritance. And Jesus has made it clear multiple times, you know, including earlier, we talked about um, he will not leave you comfortless. Comfortless. That was in John 14. Jesus will not leave um, people comfortless or fatherless or bereaved or orphans. Jesus' desire is that people that were orphaned will be brought into the family of God. So it says, ask of me. And we walking in the likeness of God and in the likeness of Jesus Christ. The same way um, Jesus you know, says, ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for your inheritance. <clears throat> well, if we're following in his footsteps. We should be asking for the heathen as not somebody that gets on my last nerve, not somebody that keeps calling. I just get sick of them. Not somebody that, oh, well, when I first ministered to them. I didn't think they're going to be just staying around five years later and still getting on my nerves. But man, I thought I'd just say a few words. They accept Christ and we move on. No. Ask of the Lord. I see some laughing there. <laughs> Ask the Lord and says, he will give us the heathen for an inheritance. So are we asking? You know, are we asking the Lord? You know, he obviously has given us capacity to help groom, to lead, to guide, to nurture, 
to heal those. And we see here, it doesn't say, ask for all those wonderfully acting saints. Ask for the heathen. <laughs> that knucklehead, that rabble rouser, that rebel, that dysfunctional, broken, you know, ill-mannered person. Ask for that. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen. So they might be unlovable now. They might be dysfunctional. They might be somebody you'd rather avoid if possible. But, you know, one of the things that God requires of us, walking in the likeness of Jesus, is that we would ask him, you know, to show us how to reach out to the heathen. Ask for the opportunities, in other words. And Jesus will be the one that will, and the Holy Spirit be the one to set the stage to position them where they can be one for Christ and healed of their brokenness and put in a place where they are now parented instead of being orphans. And, you know, God knows what we can handle. So if we ask him and say we have the desire to mentor, be a role model to, or a spiritual parent to somebody, God knows whether you can handle child number one versus child number 10. You know, maybe child number one is way too much for you to handle where you're at spiritually. So God like, oh, mm, that might break that person and end up father. So, you know, what? Uh, let me get them number 10. It's going to be rough, but they're at the place of maturity where they can handle that. One. So like, God doesn't put children into a spiritually foster home where you got to give them back or a group home. No, if he assigns somebody to you, he knows capacity of what you can handle. Like I said, I talked to somebody yesterday who ended up parenting somebody, and they said that was the most hard core to deal with. Spoke their mind, didn't care who was listening, had a lot of wounds, you know, sometimes lashed out because of the wounds and not being able to trust people because everybody in my life has let me down. So the person was lashing out, disrespectful, even brought into their home, and there was issues where the person was speaking in an insubordinate fashion and the person had to say hey look you know you're welcome to home this is your home but all roads lead to me so we're going to have certain guidelines here so the person was rough but now they have a very loving relationship and this person had asked for that type of situation for years um and got a rough one but now the situation is turned around and the person went from being bold and argumentative sometimes and sometimes saying something assertively aggressively to when the person was ready to get saved i want to go to church and get saved oh i'll just go to stay home watching online because i had something else to do this way i want to go to churches that same abruptness and roughness i'm going to i want to go to church and get saved and you're taking it so turn the situation around so are we asking amen for opportunities um, you know, or have we given up? Have we given up on those who are unlovable, living in impoverished conditions, acting dysfunctional, rebellious, you know, or are we only willing to father those who are, you know, polite and pretty well educated? Like, do we just look for the easy ones or do we say, Lord, I'm just asking for opportunity to father people. You choose and set the stage for them to be in my life. Amen. And so we're going to leave it off with that today. And I once again, thank all those who are fathers today. And, you know, praise God for the things that, you know, you have done. And especially those who are Christian fathers who have not only instilled um, a biological <coughs> fatherhood, um, in their life, an emotional connection with their children, but also those who have spiritually fathered and taught them about the goodness of God from the time, whether it's a natural biological birth, knowing them from babies, or if it's somebody that's coming to your life later on that you are fathering. You know, thank God for the role you play. And it is something that's beyond value, amen, you know, to turn a life around that feels fatherless and hopeless. And there's so many people have end up, you know, drug addicted or, or suicidal or in jail or just a wayward 
you know, life the, the, the void of peace because they have not been fathered. And if God deems to put us in a place where we can serve in that role, it is priceless beyond compare. And we probably can't even comprehend how much God, you know, loves the fact that we'd be willing to do that and serve to to him because he sees that soul and he wants to win them over to turn their lives around. And he's deemed us the ones who are able to do it. That's a tremendous blessing. So let's, you know, thank God for the fathers today and I celebrate you all. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for once again allowing us to commemorate Father's Day and, you know, today being the 50th um, celebration of it being a national holiday. We just thank you, Father, that uh, just as you had done with Mother's Day, um, you set the stage. You know, both were done, you know, by Christians. You know, Mother's Day with mothers coming together to pray um, during a civil war for the safety of their sons and the comfort for those who had lost their sons or sons who had injured, were injured or, or broken when they came home. And, um, and then with this, you know, pretty much instituted um, to commemorate first um, the loss of those men, 360 men in that coal mine, and then later on um, a woman in the church wanting to celebrate uh, the fact that her father was raising um, her and her five siblings after the loss of the mother and childbirth. So we thank you, Father, for the origin of this. We praise you, Father, that you were blessed fathers today. Um, just part of your blessings upon them. I know in some cases I've seen that um, fathers are pining for a reconnection with their children who have been held away from them um, by ex-wives or uh, disgruntled ex-girlfriends. Um, um, we just pray, Father, that you would touch their hearts, um, that they would um, just get away from their own self-interest and allow um, these fathers to have a part in their children's lives. And I know some cases I saw one person saying that his son is now grown, so the likelihood might be poor that they would ever have a connection based upon the things that have been instilled in him um, negatively about him, but he still pines for that relationship. So I just praise you, Father, that uh, you would touch the hearts of children today as well to reach out to their fathers. And um, if there have been cases where the fathers have not been engaged, ask you to do a work in their heart. Let them come to the place of repentance if necessary. Um, let them come to a place where they will apologize to their children and be active. Um, but we just praise you, Father, just to mend the breach, just as you mended the breach between us and yourself, that we would cry out to you for salvation and become your children. We praise you, Father, to um, just establish those connections and mend the breach today. And we do pray, Father, for those who have been active um, from day one in the children's lives, brought your divine peace, your health, your safety upon them, allow them to come into a deeper knowledge of you as their fathers. And um, we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.